Thank you so much for joining us today at Christ Point Church. We want you to know we're real people living real lives, serving a real God. We hope that you enjoy today's sermon by our lead pastor, Steve Qualls. Welcome home. Here's the thing. You can't win battles and hold on to your pants at the same time. So if we're, going, if we're going to go into battle, we've got to realize that this thing's got to work first and foremost. So the belt of truth, that's why Paul starts with the belt of truth. Truth. Let's look into verse 14 again. And having put on, after the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So in the Greek word for breastplate is called the thorax. And that word thorax literally means heart protector. So we've got to realize that we have to protect our heart. Our heart's where uh, it's 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 our it's our inner being. It's our depths. It's our soul, and it's 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 who we are. So the thorax is the heart protector. It's built. It, this is how it was built and designed. It was built with little small metal rounded metal pieces put onto the to, to the che, to, to the protector, and they would deflect blows. So when you know if it's rounded, and when the swords hit, it would slide off of it. So one would slide the next one to the next one to the next one until that armor slid somebody's sword off of them and it protected the, inner, the organs and it protected the heart in battle. It was designed with individual strips. Now, that, that's pretty important to having, you know, they didn't put just one big metal thing on. See, in, in battle, we, we, we think of an armor and we think of that thing as being one big, one big shield thing and you put it on. You can't move with that on. So... They were so smart, they were so advanced that they realized that if they built this thing in strips and then put put rounded uh, metal on the outside of it, it created a freedom of movement. They had a freedom of movement, yet a, a, a protection at the same time that other armies didn't have. So that gave them a definite advantage. This breastplate, it protects vital organs. It protects the heart. It was built to deflect blows. So if we don't have the breastplate of righteousness on, then blows get penetrated. Blows land. And when blows land, they hurt worse. So let me tell you something. It's not the easiest thing to go through a battle. But it's really hard when you're beat down during the battle or you're injured during the battle. So this is what would happen with the breastplate. It would be placed over the shoulders. Now, contrary to, to uh, folklore or, 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 or conventional thinking, you know, we, we've always heard preachers preach the sermons, and, and, you know, the only part of the armor that, 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 uh, that is not mentioned is there's no, there's no armor in the back, so God's never built us for retreat. Now, that's true, but that's not all the way true. God hasn't built us for retreat, but, but the armor was the same front and back. When they put it on, it had the same thing back here as it does up front. And it was tied together on the sides, and it it gave movement. See, the breastplate was wrapped front and back. Paul calls it a breastplate of righteousness. He calls it a breastplate of righteousness. God God places and plants righteous mobility. If we don't have a mobility, if we don't have a freedom of movement in who we are, then God plants this in us. If we don't have that mobility in the heart of man, then we're going to fail. If we don't have that planted, that righteousness planted, outside of God there is no righteousness. So if we think we're going to go into battle with just anything, it's not going to work. If we're going to think we're going to go into battle without armoring up, it's not going to work. There is no righteousness outside of God's armor, outside of God's righteousness. Man's heart without God, without God's open heart surgery and his open heart transplant, man's heart natural without God's supernatural transplant will never beat, uh, will never beat uh, with righteousness. Our hearts will never beat with righteousness. So the breastplate was tied to the belt to keep that thing from riding up. It was kept in place to protect the heart, and righteousness has been tied to truth. So we've got to realize, I can't go into battle. I can't go into warfare, and I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. I can't go into any kind of warfare if I don't understand what I'm doing. I don't understand what I'm wearing. I can't go into warfare if I don't start out with truth tied to righteousness. Because 
if we don't do these two things, we are not suiting up with the armor of God. We're suiting up with the armor of Steve and Tina and 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 uh, 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 whoever. We're, we're we're suiting up with with our own armor. The Bible must and has to be interpreted by the Bible. I've said this before. We can't interpret what's right and wrong on our, on our own. The Bible must interpret the Bible. The moment we substitute our own degree of righteousness, think about it. The moment that we substitute our own degree of righteousness in place of God's righteousness is the moment that we are not wearing the right, right armor. See, what righteousness our own sight Oh, when we when when we uh, when we when we have our own substitute, then we're we're serving our own selves. We have our own opinion of what's right and what's wrong. So it's like you know you hear people say, "Well, I, I do that. I don't feel like it's wrong." It's because you have a level of righteousness that 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 you have interpreted, not the word. It's right. It's wrong. Oh, well, it's not. It's not wrong for me. Yeah, I think it's wrong. You know. Uh, we, our own opinion will let us down. See, our heart is exposed at that time to the enemy. And when our heart's exposed, he's going to have it. So let's go to verse 15. Let's look at one more, one more aspect of this, of this armor. He says, and as shoes for your feet. And as shoes for your feet. Let me explain something to you. Shoes of readiness or shoes of peace. The Roman soldiers' shoes were sandals. They were sandals. So, and you think, why sandals? Why not something a little bit better? See, they were strapped over the calf, but under the knee. So they weren't they weren't strapped up to the, uh, uh, above the knee because that would have limited mobility. They were strapped over the calf to keep them from falling down, for stability. They were open air because in those days they didn't clean like we clean. They didn't go to Walmart and buy Dove soap. They didn't have those kinds of things. They didn't have uh, 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 you know uh, uh, that, that athletic foot powder. So. They were open air, to, you know, not, no fungus that way, no blisters that way, so they were open air. But they had metal in the soles of the shoes to keep them from wearing and to give them strength. And then the bottom not only had metal, but they had metal studs on the bottom for traction. This is probably the most important part. They had traction. They had metal shields on the front of the foot and on the front of the shin to protect them. The Roman soldier had an advantage over an opponent in battle because he could stand when the battle was at its worst. He could stand. The other guy couldn't stand. Maybe it's raining out. Maybe it's muddy out. Maybe it's not the best of conditions. And see, here's what I think we do. We have too many in this world, and I have been there myself, we have too many fair-weathered Christians. I would like to fight my battles when it's pretty. I would like to fight my battles uh, the way I want to fight them. I would like to, I don't want to fight that battle. I want to fight this battle. So you don't get to pick and choose if it's raining or not raining that day. Back in 2,000 years ago, when they went into warfare, they had to make sure that they were ready to go. And the one who had the cleats on is the one who had the traction. So the one who had the traction was the one who could stand and the other was at a disadvantage. And I'd be willing to say that a lot of battles were, were strategically planned on slopes and slick, uh, slick footing just so they would have that, that, that advantage. See, the metal studs gave them traction and stability. We shouldn't be easily knocked off our feet in battle. We shouldn't be easily knocked off our feet in battle. Sometimes we're just so quickly knocked off our feet that, and our bell's been rung. We're like, you know, I don't, I don't get it. What, why, is it, it why, why, why did I get knocked down? It's because maybe we weren't fitted with the shoes of peace. Maybe we didn't get enough traction. Satan will make sure the battleground is always slippery and he'll make sure it's always dark. Remember verse 12, cosmic powers over this present darkness. So remember, he wants to drag you from the light into the darkness where he's comfortable. He has, he has night vision. He's good at it. If he can get you in the darkness, he can defeat you. So he doesn't want to do battle in the light. He, does, he wants to do it in the darkness, on slippery slopes. Anytime our feet shuffle towards re retreat, run away, selfish desire, impurity, impure thoughts, deceit, lies. Anytime our feet shuffle away, and onto anything like that, more towards us, more towards the world, and less toward Christ, then we are on muddy slopes, 
we are on, in dark places and the, the enemy just, just thrives in those kinds of places. So the minute that we do that is the minute that we start moving into his place. So we've spent too many days on the steep slopes of not enough. Way too many days on the sleep, steep slopes of not enough. We've settled too many times for just enough. Not just just enough. Just enough is okay. How many times have we prayed for God to cover a, 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 a bill that we owe? Lord, my such, such and such bill is due. I need uh, $272. And, 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 you know, we're praying and settling for just enough. We're praying for just enough. Lord, you know what? Uh, I had a, a, a guy tell us one time years ago, he said his wife was in a terrible accident. She wasn't going to live. Her leg was probably going to have to be amputated. He went into prayer. It was at Erlanger. He went into prayer and said, Lord, forget the leg. Just let her live. Lord, I, just let her live. And he said he looked up, and, and he had been in there many times seeing families. And he looked up at the same face of Jesus on this picture. And Jesus, Jesus just spoke to him through that picture and said, why do you, why do you limit what I can do? Why do you want her just to live but, but not be whole? Why can't I do it all? And he, he said, I just went into revival right there. People thought I was crazy. He said, I went into revival. He said, and not only did she live, he said her, her leg went back together, all the bones. He said within 40-something days, they didn't have to put her in a cast. Everything went back together. And she doesn't even walk with a limp to this day. So we've settled for too many days of just enough when Jesus is trying to give us equipment and give us training for more than enough. He's, he's, try, he's like, hey, I'm giving you everything you need for more than enough and you don't seem to want to use it. Our world does not seem to want to use it. I mean, right now, there's, in, this, in this country, we are anticipating and, and we're, we're with bated breath a stimulus package that will give me a few more dollars. I'm waiting for my government to take care of me. When you know what? My God said, I'm over here. What's wrong with me? I'm the one that gives. Don't, don't, don't repent. I'm the one that gives them. Come to me. I'll, pray to me. Seek me. Because I'm the God of more than enough. You're always going to be, be less than that if we don't come in there and, and we, don't, we don't understand where our, 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 our help comes. So in verse 12, I want to make, a, I want to make a, a, a comparison here, something that jumped out at me. In verse 12, Paul gives us four distinct personalities of the enemy. I should have lined all these up, would have been easier, because if you're dyslexic like I am, that just looks like a big old bunch of words. So, um, so <laughs> slow down, read real slow, that's what I have to do. But in verse 12, Paul gives us four distinct personalities of the enemy. He says, rulers, authorities, Cosmic powers and spiritual forces. Now, when we read this, we realize we're none of these things. We realize that the, the, the warfare that we're up against, and let me just kind of say it before I say it, is if we think that this is for somebody else, or if, we're think, if we think that we can slide through and we just pretend that there's no warfare going on, we're, we're like my friend of mine, you say we're badly mistaken. We're sadly mistaken. So I'm going to tell you something. This is what he says in verse 12. Four distinctive personalities of the enemy. Rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, and spiritual forces in the heavenly places in the darkness, the, uh, over this present darkness. So with those four, if you don't take this serious, right here, this part, then you will never find the armor that fits you. If we don't realize how serious the battle is, then we will always be walking outside of the armor. And we will always be look on the outside looking in and trying to figure out why they make it and I don't. Why am I always trying to figure out how to wake up and make it from day to day when these people seem to thrive? It may be we have that these people have a spiritual armor on. These people understand how to wear the full armor of God and they don't back down from it. Okay, so Paul gives us four levels of attack. Now I want to jump back to that, verse 12. Four levels of attack. And this is what the devil is. This is who the devil is. Rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, spiritual forces. This is who the devil is. And he will use that one verse to beat the living daylights out of each and every one of us. He, 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 he's good at it. This is who he is, but let me show you who you are. 
See, we're not going to leave here without this, I mean, and, and let the enemy have, have any footing. We're the ones that have the cleats. So let me show you who you are. When we put on the full armor of God, this is who we are in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Every level of attack by the enemy in Ephesians 6 is not just a counter in 1 Peter 2, 9, but it is more than enough in 1 Peter 2, 9. See, every personality of evil and every characteristic of, a, of deceit is countered with the priesthood the priesthood of more than enough in, in 1 Peter 2 9. So I'm going to show you the counterattack. Number one, the devil gives rulers in Ephesians chapter 6. The devil's the one that gives the rulers. The devil's the one that 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 embodies the rulers. The he, he's, he's, it's the same enemy. You notice it always says the, the rulers, the authorities, these cosmic, the cosmic powers, these spiritual forces. It's not a different enemy, it's the same enemy all the time. So, the devil gives rulers, but in 1 Peter 2, 9, the Lord calls you a chosen race. A chosen race. See, let me explain to you what that means when rulers want to rule over a chosen race. A chosen race of people aren't ruled by unqualified, unholy, and unchosen rulers. So, it's kind of like somebody coming to my house. I'm just going to tell you how it is. I'm country. We, we, you know, we're southern spoken. We is who we is. If somebody knocks on my door and says, hey, I think I'm going to take your house. I, I, I'm going to give you about three hours to get out. I'm fig pull my gun. And I'm going to say, I'm giving you about three seconds to get off my porch. <laughs> By the way, you guys watch your team. We'll be visiting you this afternoon from Christ Point Church to welcome you home. <laughs> but... but uh, but see, I'm a chosen race. Just because a ruler comes to my house and says, I own your house, I say, oh, no, you don't. Because I do. You don't own it, I do. Now get off my porch. And see, this is what we're buying into. The ruler comes in and says, you don't know how to fight this battle. This battle is bigger than you. This is a spiritual battle, and you have no right or even, 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 you have nothing. No, you have no ground to even stand on. And we have to back up and say, wait a minute. In 1 Peter 2, 9, my God calls me a chosen people, a chosen race. I'm a chosen race. And you know what? You're not the one I choose to be my ruler. God is my chosen ruler, and I'm his chosen race. So you know what? You ain't qualified. You're not, you're not holy enough, and you're not chosen I'm chosen, you're not, so you're not my ruler. Let me show you what the devil does again. In, in, in number two, the devil in Ephesians chapter 6 says, manipulates our thinking with authority. So these, these authorities, these authorities in dark places, uh, the, the authorities. But, but 1 Peter 2, 9 says, the Lord says, authorities have no authority over a royal priesthood. Authorities have no authority over a royal, priest, a royal priesthood. So not only does he call us a chosen race, but he calls us a royal priesthood. Now I'm going to challenge our guys here and our girls too. We are still walking with a limp. When we come out of our PM, we realize that we're, we're a royal priesthood, that we are, we are chosen to be God's race of people, and we better be walking with a limp. We better be walking with who we know we are. See, priests know how to wear the whole armor. Priests are good at it. So I'm a royal priest. A priest, priests have a different mentality than the others. God says you're you're a royal priesthood. You don't you're not subject to those authorities. Number three, the devil in Ephesians chapter six wants to scare you and control you with fear through what the wording cosmic powers. Now some other versions will say it differently, but my version that I read all the time says cosmic powers. When we hear cosmic powers, we think, oh my gosh. That word cosmic and powers, I can't, I don't have those. You know, I can't make things appear and disappear. So I have no cosmic powers. And 1 Peter 2, 9 says, put on the full armor of God, so to speak. Walk in confidence because you are a holy nation. And a holy nation is not subject to cosmic powers. Do you realize you're a priesthood? Do you realize you're a chosen race? 
Do you realize you're a holy nation? And when the devil says, do you realize I have cosmic powers? What cosmic powers? I have, I have God. That's all I need. I don't need you to come in here and start trying to convince me because I am a holy nation. See, cosmic, the word cosmic is trickery and sleight of hand. Holy is the literal atmosphere of God. I mean, it is the literal atmosphere of Jesus Christ. So number four, the devil prides himself in what he may call an elite special forces. See, in Ephesians chapter 6, we do this, we have this battle against spiritual forces of evil. You notice it kind of gets a little worse and a little worse and a little worse. A little more evil and a little more evil and le- until we get to the spiritual forces of evil. These are the things that scare the living daylights out of us. See, these spiritual forces of evil, we can't do, we can't do warfare against spiritual forces of evil. And God says, yeah, you must be proud of your elite SEAL Team 6, so to speak, spiritual forces. But I'm not going to let that own my people. I'm not going to let that, that, that mentality steal what's mine. Because this is what he says in 1 Peter 2.9, that we are a people of his possession. And when God says, you belong to me, do you belong to me? You know, when I'm, when I'm battling over who I am in the Lord, And I'm saying, Lord, I don't know if I... Does he say, do you belong to me? You want me to show it to you? Here's what it looks like. Do you want to see it? It's 1 Peter 2, 9. If you want to see it, I'll show it to you. And I just lost my place. But he says, he says, I'll show it to you. You are a people of my possession. Do you not... I mean, it's like having a child. Whose child is that? We don't walk around and say, well, bless his heart. We gave birth to him, but we don't have, he's not ours. You know, that kid's going to be Joe Dirt. He's going to be dragged off somewhere else and live and live with a, a, a wig on. No, that's my kid. You know, some of you go, yeah, that's my kid. What do you do? That's my kid. That's the one. That's my child. God says, are you not my child? Then walk like you're my child. If you're my child. See, but notice with me, four levels of evil in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6. Four distinct powers of counterattack in 1 Peter 2 9. The devil in Ephesians chapter 6 wins by dragging the Christian into the darkness. And when he gets you in the darkness where you're slip and you can't stand, he will beat, he will beat you till you don't know what you don't know where you're washing or hanging out. He will beat you, and you are so confused at that point, you can't even think a thought. That's exactly what he wants to do. But 1 Peter 2, 9 says we are to proclaim. That's what the word says. Proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out, not, not in, but called you out of the darkness. I feel like I'm getting beat up all the time. Well, you're fighting in the darkness. Proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. See, we've got to understand that the armor is the one thing the armor does. If it doesn't do anything else, it illuminates. And this is what it does. It says no more darkness, no more advantage from the, from the enemy, no more slippery slopes, no more darkness. And you know what? If he's going to fight now, he's going to fight on my turf. Because you my people or not? Yes, I am. Then this is how we fight. This is one of those drop the mic things right here. Get this. Get this in our heads and life will never be the same. Battles will never be overwhelming again. The battles will come, but they won't be overwhelming. And every battle gets dragged into the light. We have to realize the first thing we want to do is cry, retreat, complain. The first thing we want to do is is freak out, run, whatever. But the first thing we should all do is we say, wait a minute, I'm getting dragged into the darkness and I'm fit gold my knees and I'm going to drag him into the light. So that's what I'm about to do. Into the light is the opposite of the darkness as far as the battle. This is where he beats you to death. But in the lights where he gets the living daylights beat out of him, he don't like that very often. So he don't want that over and over and over, so he'll quit that. He'll quit doing that. 
So here's my challenge. It's time for us to realize that our truth and our righteousness and our peace is all tied together. Our traction is all tied together. It's time to realize if we're going to win the battles, then we're going to have to put on the armor. And it's time to realize that, listen, we are a chosen race of people. We are a holy nation. We are a priesthood of believers. We are a God's own possession that will proclaim Him over the darkness and in, in His marvelous light. So I want to challenge you to come and let's pray. Stand with me in the name of Jesus. Let's pray right now. Let's ask the Lord into our heart. Because I'm going to tell you, you're either armored up or you're not. You're either walking in power or you're not. You're either walking and understanding who we are in Jesus or we're not. And it's not a good time in this season, which I don't think we're going to move into a, a lighter season. I think this is, this is life and it gets worse from here. I'm not, I'm not doing that. It gets worse as far as society gets better as a Christian. So now's the time to start stepping into who we are in Christ and stepping out of the darkness. Hello again, and thank you for tuning in. I pray that today's sermon has spoken to your heart and has ministered to you well. Uh, we just want you to know that uh, we have two locations, one at our Sparta campus, our main campus at Sparta on the square in Sparta, and our second campus is at Smithfield behind Ace Hardware. And we would love for you to call Christ Point Church your church home. And uh, if, you're, if you're viewing this and you can't get, get in, uh, to church and you feel like you, you want to be a part of the church, then you can always be a part of the church. Just just drop us a note and let us know that you enjoy uh, being on board with us. And if you'd like to give and be a part of the ministry, then uh, you can do that by, by just sending a check to one of the locations at 614 Murphy Street, Smithfield, 13 Liberty Square in Sparta. And uh, we'll get you on the road. We just love you so much. And you can download the Christ Point Church of Tennessee app and and you can give online. So we are real people. We're living real lives and we're, we're serving a real God. And we just want to tell everyone, welcome home. We're so glad that you tuned in with us. Welcome home.